So let's start by looking how introductions of papers are organized. So often introductions are organized as an inverted triangle, uh, where at the beginning of the introduction, we start with very broad information, uh, and then we get more specific uh, as we go to the bottom of the introduction. Okay, So what we're depicting here of this inverted triangle is how specific uh, the information is. And so we start with broad information, which in a paper would uh, be the broad relevance of the study. Okay, so this may uh, be some sort of uh, what you may have remembered from writing classes, some sort of way to like get the reader's attention. Maybe this is an environmental problem or a human health problem or some other problem that uh, so you tie the um, significance of your study into. And then, so I like to think of uh, three main, um, three kind of landmarks uh, within the introduction. So the first is the broad relevance of study. The second is what is not known or what are the knowledge gaps, okay, uh, that need to be addressed or the study is attempting to address. And then finally, uh, the third major landmark is the purpose or the hypothesis of the study. So this helps to organize uh, the what comes next as far as the experimental design and the data that we see. And so what is in between each of these landmarks? So between the broader relevance of the study and the knowledge gaps, right, uh, there's a summary of the prior relevant studies. More importantly, what is known, right, uh, that links, right, the uh, links uh, between the relevance of the study and what the knowledge gap that we're trying to address in the study. And then between the two, the second two landmarks, right, is as soon as we identify what the knowledge gap is, right, we want to see if we can find some sort of relevant clues uh, that uh, help uh, towards formulating some sort of hypothesis uh, or purpose of the study. Okay, so let's take a look at how this looks um, in a paper. So here's a paper um, that is discussing uh, protein nitration. Uh, and so we start at the top of the introduction. So the introduction uh, I've, I've uh, sort of color coded, and we'll talk about what each of those color coding means. But the green, right, uh, are going to be those kind of major landmarks that I discussed. Uh, in the slides, uh, and then the yellow regions, uh, highlighted regions, so it could be sort of everything that is in between those uh, landmarks. Okay, so we start uh, with this uh, first uh, highlighted region, okay, uh, where this says nitrated tyrosine residues have been used as a marker of the involvement of nitric oxide and its related chemistry in a number of pathophysiological disorders. Okay, so this indicates uh, and this starts to list a number of uh, different uh, human diseases, such as neurodegeneration, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, septic shock, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so the broad relevance, right, is related to human health and specific, and a little bit more specifically, right, uh, understanding nitrated tyrosine re uh, residues, right, uh, they tell us something as being a biomarker of uh, human diseases. Okay, um, then we continue to go uh, from this uh, broad relevance uh, to start understanding what is known about nitrated tyrosine residues, which uh, the authors have elected to uh, abbreviate as NT. And so the first sentence of this next paragraph foreshadows a conflict. So it says several mechanisms of NT formation have been proposed and its origin remains controversial. Uh, this highlights that there's some uh, disagreement or conflict in the literature about how NT uh, nitrated tyrosines are formed, right? And from there, they start to talk about uh, one of the main hypotheses or the main uh, pathways uh, is through this peroxy nitrate molecule shown here. And this sort of summarizes uh, uh, the uh, large amount of uh, work uh, that has been done uh, looking at NT formation by peroxy nitrate. Uh, and then, again, uh, it alludes to this conflict. And in the next, uh, at the beginning of the next paragraph, it starts to discuss an alternate mechanism of how nitrated tyrosines might be formed, uh, which is uh, 
which it says, in addition to a peroxynitrite mediated pathway, NT formation has been shown to result from the cat catalysis of nitrite oxidation by peroxidases, which are a metal enzyme. Okay, thus providing alternate mechanism for its formation in vivo. So uh, we started by looking by uh, the authors saying that there's controversy, and it's immediately showing what this controversy is by showing uh, one uh, proposed pathway for nitrated tyrosine formation, uh, and then immediately introducing the second uh, uh, pathway, a second pathway for nitrated tyrosine residue formation, uh, and juxtaposition in those two. Now, what follows says, although leukocyte peroxidases likely account for substantial amount of NT production in vivo, this mechanism fails to explain NT formation in the absence of inflammatory cells or peroxidases, okay? So what it's directly discussing here is a knowledge gap, okay? So what the sentence is saying is that we know that this works uh, with peroxidases, but what how do we get... Um, how do we get nitrated tyrosine formation if there are no peroxidases and there's no route towards forming uh, peroxynitrate? So that's that's indicating a gap uh, in our knowledge. And so this indicates what this paper um, is going is going to attempt to address is this knowledge gap here. Okay, showing green. All right, this continues. So the final program, uh, paragraph starts, NT has been shown to occur in distinct proteins rather than in an indiscriminate manner. So this is providing some sort of clue uh, as to what might address this knowledge gap. And so they say, right, they're high. They say in the next sentence, which is also highlighted in green, right, this may result from variations in protein susceptibility to nitration due to conformational differences or to association with redox active metals, okay? This is the hypothesis of the paper, okay? And so, more specifically, uh, uh, they are testing the hypothesis that redox active metals uh, are important uh, for addressing the knowledge gap above, and uh, what they aim to do then is to test this hypothesis. And so the final sentence uh, is a short summary of what follows experimentally uh, that allows them to test this hypothesis that uh, redox active metals um, uh, allow for uh, formation of nitrated tyrosine residues. And so you see this follows, again, uh, this inverted triangle where we start very broad, right, uh, and that with the broad significance, and then as we continue, we go to uh, identifying the knowledge gap and then proposing a, hypo a specific hypothesis that will be tested in the paper. And so uh, another place that can give you a good uh, sort of hold on these three uh, places is, of course, the abstract. And so the abstract is here. And so the first three sentences actually follow this exact same structure. So the chemical origins, right, the first sentence uh, discusses the chemical origins of nitrated tyrosine residues, right, uh, for patho uh, pathophysiological conditions, right? That reflects this first paragraph here. And then all no, numerous studies have concluded that NT is a signature for peroxynitrite formation. Other works suggest the primary involvement of peroxidases. So again, that alludes uh, to this controversy and the uh, subsequent knowledge gap uh, that we're not able to resolve this controversy yet. Uh, and then finally, because metal homeostasis is often disrupted in conditions bearing NT, the role of metal catalysts, metals as catalysts for protein nitration was examined. And so this indicates the purpose of the study, uh, which the hypothesis is a little bit better explained uh, within the introduction, but uh, this alludes to uh, what the purpose of this is uh, to test this hypothesis.